Last week in our opening study on prayer, we began our study on the Lord's Prayer. And we mentioned this this was a, a prayer um, to be a model or a, uh, a pattern for all of our prayers. I don't believe that Jesus was necessarily um, saying every time you pray to God, pray these words, these exact words. I believe rather what Jesus was doing was giving us a model, a pattern after which we are called um, to pray. Now, I don't think it's wrong at all to pray the Lord's Prayer. In fact, I think we should always pray. And in fact, last week I challenged us um, to pray this prayer every day and to every day focus on a different phrase in the Lord's Prayer to focus and meditate and think about what is the meaning of this short, brief prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Jesus said, "Um, and when you pray, pray like this. It was a teaching opportunity that Jesus gave um, to his disciples. And last week, you know, I challenged you to pray that prayer. Take one phrase of that and to um, meditate Focus upon it. I believe that prayer is one of the most powerful weapons that Christians have in our arsenal. And yet it remains one of the most mysterious and underutilized parts of our spiritual armor. Prayer is something that needs to be learned. Something that needs to be practiced. Something we need to work on and to hone our skills on. The disciples were mystified and curious about the prayer life of Jesus. And Luke tells us that one day after observing Jesus praying, they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Isn't it interesting that that the disciples didn't say, or we don't have really a record of it, but the disciples didn't say, Lord, teach us to preach like you do. Lord, teach us to attract, attract those big crowds of thousands of people. Teach us to do that. They observed Jesus alone, spending time with God, his Father in heaven. They said, we want to do that. We want to know how to do that. And Jesus responded to their request by teaching them what we've come to know as the the Lord's Prayer. Last week, we examined the first uh, phrase of the Lord's Prayer, those first six words, Our Father who art in heaven. Now this doesn't mean just say these words, but to believe that God is our Father. He's our Father in heaven. And we can relate to Him as a Father. You see, we cannot really pray the Lord's Prayer without first establishing a relationship with the Lord through faith in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. We can't have a relationship with God until we are born again into the family of God. And so when we begin our prayer with our Father, we begin to pray based on an intimate relationship with God. A relationship like God is our Father and we are his children. Now, God is a just and righteous judge. But he's not an angry judge looking for the opportunity to condemn us and to pronounce us guilty. Nor is he an aloof God who is way out there that we can't know and commune with. He's not a distant God who's too busy for us. He is rather our father. And he can be approached In an intimate way, like our daddy. Now having established the foundational awareness that God is our father, let's move on to the first petitions of this prayer. Hallowed be thy name. When you pray, hallowed be thy name, you climb to a new level of respect for God. And reverence for who he is. 
You are ascending to the very heart of God, recognizing the almighty God that he is and what he has done for us. What does it mean to hallow his name? It's not a word that we use very much in our world today. Well, the word hallow comes from the Greek word hagios, which means holy. Hallow means to set apart, set apart for a particular purpose. It means to consider holy. It means to treat as holy. The best modern word perhaps would be uh, reverence or respect. I believe that this hallowing or reverence for God is something that's wholly lacking in our American society. And if we are ever to be spiritually revitalized and to wake up the sleeping giant of the church, we must recapture and rediscover the holiness of God. One of the first things that Jesus taught his disciples about prayer was to revere the name of God. Think about his attributes, his character, his names, and that will lift us up towards heaven, to the throne of God. When we pray, hallowed be your name, we are saying, Lord, let your name be holy and reverenced here on earth, just as it already is in heaven. May your name be given the unique reverence that is due your character and your nature as our heavenly father. When we begin our prayers, hallowed be thy name. We're not just rushing into the presence of God to ask him for stuff for us. Rather, we're coming into his presence, recognizing who God is and what he can do for us. The name of God is always an expression of his character. The psalmist in um, Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name and the character of the Lord our God. We hallow God's name when we have a reverence for him. When we understand that God's names reveal who God desires us to, who God desires to be in relation to us, and when we realize his names, Uh, that God invites us into a relationship with him. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. He's saying that we can see the awesomeness, the sovereignty of God all around us. We can see it in creation so that no one really has an excuse not to believe in God. Verse 19, 1, a familiar passage. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim his handiwork. I think I probably told you that. When we lived in Harrisonburg, uh, the the sky was really dark at at night, and we had a clear, open sky, and and I would take the dog, and and we'd walk at night, and I would just, I would walk looking like this at at the wonder of the heavens, at the beauty of the stars, and I would think of this verse about God declaring his handiwork to his people. We can revere God and we can worship God by praying through the names of God. Each of the names of God reveals a specific character about who God is. Pull out your uh, bulletin insert. And these are some of the names of God uh, that are found in Scripture. First is Elohim. These are uh, Hebrew words. Elohim, it means the mighty creator. Adonai, Master or Lord. El Shaddai, 
Almighty, Almighty God. Elon Elyon, Most High. El Roy, the Strong One that Sees. El Olam, Everlasting God. Jehovah, Self-Existent One. I am that I am, God responded to Moses. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Jehovah Munkadesh, the Lord who sacrifices, who sanctifies. And that, that means who makes us right through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner, God whose banner over us is love, we, the uh, Vacation Bible School song. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Rafi, the God who heals. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is here. Jehovah Tiskenu, the Lord of righteousness. When we pray, we should acknowledge God's names in reference to our needs. The name of God is supremely and fully revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in his intercessory prayer to God in the upper room, it's found in John 17. And this is really should be called the Lord's Prayer because this is when the Lord is actually praying and he was praying for his disciples and for those who would come after them and he was praying that they would be one but this is one thing he prayed and he said and he's talking to God his father and he says I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world they were yours and you gave them to me and they have obeyed your word they've responded to your grace is what he's saying. In other words, Jesus said, I have revealed your character and hallowed your name in the life that I have lived while walking on earth. Jesus said another time, he said, he who has seen me, if you've seen me, you've seen God in heaven, God the Father. Jesus came to personally reveal to the world what God is like and who God is. Second, when we hallow God's name in our relationship with him, when, uh, when Jesus taught us to pray, hallowed be thy name, he was telling us to, to make the presence of God real in our hearts. When you pray, hallowed be your name, you are placing God on the throne of your heart. You're putting him first and foremost above everything else in the world. It's about putting God on the throne of our lives while we're here on earth, just as like it is in heaven where he is now. His name is hallowed in our relationship when in praying, hallowed be thy name. We mean that first and foremost, before anything else, we desire that our life um, reveals the character and the nature of God. That spiritual maturity is is our lives conforming into the likeness and image of Jesus Christ. That's how we become more mature. Uh, Because we are created in the image and likeness of God. And everyone, everyone we see, what would be, how would the world be different if everyone we looked at, we saw as somebody created in the image and likeness of of God. Now they may, may not be acting that out. But that's the potential lying within them. How would the world be different? And we should be concerned with every detail of our lives that we are living life for his glory. Whatever mission or ministry you or I undertake, our first thought should be, is this for God's glory? I wonder how this attitude would change our society if every Christ follower would adopt this attitude. I wonder how this attitude would change the way we communicate on social media. Would this post glorify God? Would this response to a post 
glorify God? Would this action glorify God? Would this comment about another person glorify God? Would God be glorified should be in our thoughts when we choose uh, what books we read or what movies we watch. This phrase applies to the friends that we make and how we treat them. It should be the chief concern of all of our habits that we form and all of the ambitions that we desire. This should be the supreme object of every pleasure that we seek. This should be our attitude concerning every sorrow we face. Will God be glorified in this? How will God be glorified in this? Next, we hallow his name by our reflection of him in our lives. Paul once warned the church at Rome, listen to these words. God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Paul was talking to the church at Rome and he's saying because of your actions, the way you are living your lives, the things you are doing, the things you are not doing, you are blaspheming the name of God. It's a sobering thought to realize that the failure on our part to hallow the name of God has disastrous consequences in causing the name of God to be blasphemed in the world. We see it happen all the time. Look at what's going on in the Catholic Church with the the abuse that has happened and how that's impacted the world. Think about that in in all of our churches and all of our lives on a smaller level. As people see us and we fail, it impacts their view and understanding of God. Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, certainly that's true. I'm a hypocrite and so are you. But we are saved by grace through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't stay. We shouldn't be happy being hypocrites. We shouldn't be a hypocrite and be proud of it. Rather, we should be sorrow, sorrowful. So when we pray each day, hallowed be thy name, we are saying, Father, your reputation is at stake in me today. May I live in such a way as to be a credit to who you are. May others see your character through my behavior and honor your name because of what they see of you in me. Well, let me sum up what it means to pray, hallowed be thy name. Five essentials about honoring God's name. One, God has a name. God has many names. And each of his name um, represents a character trait. One, God's name is holy. God is like no other. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. He is wholly other than who we are. Three, God wants us to praise him. He's a jealous God, and he desires, after all he's given to us, he desires that we give back to him our praises. I can praise God's name in the Lord's Prayer. And finally, God will not force anyone to praise his name. He wants us to praise him, but he's not going to force us to do it. It's our choice. We can choose to accept God and his grace and his desire and will for our lives, or we can reject it. God allows us that choice. Now, the consequences of that choice are eternal. They're forever. Accept God's grace. Invite Jesus into your heart. You go to dwell in heaven and be with him forever and ever and ever. And there is nothing like that on earth that we can begin to imagine. But to reject God's offer of grace is to choose to be eternally separated from God in a place that is worse than anything we can possibly 
imagine. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. As I close this morning, I thought that maybe we um, frozen, chosen Presbyterians might benefit a little bit from listening from a lively Afro-American pastor, uh, E.V. Hill, one of the great preachers of the 20th uh, century. He died, I think, in 2003. But he was the pastor of the Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles. And his, this famous sermon that he preached contains a vivid description of our almighty God and why we should pray, hallowed be thy name. Let's watch this. <laughs> Amazing how he, in a very short time, compressed this wonderful description of who God is. Is God... Your king? Is he your father in heaven? If he is, then let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Amen.